My first question is, as an individual who manages media and league assets, how have you needed to adapt to the social distancing measures that have pushed people into virtual environments? Has there been more of a push to highlight some of the NFL's virtual assets? If so, how? You know, the, the part that I'm involved with is media. So if you're, you know, if we're selling tele, a television network, NFL network, or we're selling, a, 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 you know, an online asset like NFL.com or NFL mobile, um, COVID actually is a little bit of a help from an audience, from a consumption standpoint. People aren't traveling, people aren't doing other things, people are locked down and people are watching television. The way they're watching television might change. They're watching more streaming services than, than you know, uh, traditional uh, networks. But media consumption is actually up through COVID. So from that strict business sense, it's, you know, it, it's kind of the same old, same old. Consumption is up and it's, it, that hasn't really changed much. Um, the, uh, the thing that's changed is uh, the advertising part of it. Um, you know, the, the way money gets spent, uh, you know, if you're an airline, you're not spending now because no one's traveling. If you're a hotel, you're not spending. If you're a consumer packaged good like uh, Clorox and you're selling wipes, you know, uh, Clorox wipes, you don't really have to advertise because you, you can't keep it on the shelf. So why spend money advertising? So it, that part of it, you know, the, the demand side has changed. The supply side, the, the rating points that are available for, for advertisers hasn't really changed. So COVID has had a huge impact on the NFL business in general, but in my little world of media, not so much. I mean, it, you know, it, personally, I'm not traveling into the office. Um, and obviously there's lots of hardships and, and changes for, for us all personally. But from a business standpoint, not terribly different in, in our corner of the world. The NFL in general, you know, the, 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 the league has seen a lot of changes because, um, you know, it, it, it's, we're testing players uh, virtually every day. Um, and there's going to be about a million tests done um, on players, you know, throughout the season. Play, it's, it's players and, and you know, and team officials and, you know, the, 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 all, the, all the, the coaches and, you know, the whole staff of, of every team. So from a financial standpoint, I mean, the league is spending $100 million on COVID tests. And that's, that came out of nowhere. It's a $100 million expense, um, which, is, which is tremendous. Uh, there are games that are, you know, we just canceled the Pro Bowl, for instance, which is like the all-star game that, that happens before the Super Bowl because we're probably gonna need an extra week because it canceled games. So there's huge upheaval in the overall business of the NFL, just like everyone else. But we're probably better uh, positioned to, to handle things because we've guaranteed income. We get income from the broadcast networks and that comes in no matter what. So, you know, a lot of problems, but I don't think anyone's crying about all the benefit to the NFL so soon. I don't know, I, I think I answered the question if I didn't. Yeah, I yeah, thank it. you. <laughs> How else, how else can I help you guys? I mean, what do you guys want to know about? I know what I was worried about when I was uh, in college, and I, I assume it's the same kind of worries, like where am I going to work? How do I find a job? All of that stuff. I, I'm open to any kind of those questions as well, not just about the NFL. Like William has a question. Yeah, I just have a quick question. How did you, um, you briefly touched on it, but how did you end up with the NFL? So I was in the media business for a long time before that on the, on the buying side, not on the selling side. And, um, and when I made a change over to VH1, um, I, at the time, I'm not a particularly huge sports fan. I was a casual football fan. I follow the Jets, unfortunately. They stink. Uh, they stunk when I was a kid. They stunk. They stink now. Um, I uh, knew somebody who I used to do business with and they needed somebody with my skill set. And they said, do you want to come over to the league? And I was like, I don't think so. It's not really my thing. I'd rather do something else. Um, but I ended up going just to speak to them for, you know, to, about the position. And it certainly wasn't a, you know, guarantee that I'd get it, but I wanted to talk to them about it. And it seemed intriguing to me because at the time uh, I was strictly a TV guy. So I was buying television media and selling television. And at the time, uh, NFL.com was being brought in house. So they had farmed it out to CBS Sportsline. That's a, another company. 
who was selling all the advertising. And in 2007, the NFL said, we're gonna do it ourselves. So when I went over to the NFL, the intriguing part to me was that uh, the digital, I wasn't the TV guy coming in who doesn't know digital. I was the TV guy coming in and nobody there knew digital. So I was able to learn about the digital business with everybody else. And that allowed me, that, that, that pivot allowed me to really um, increase my value in the marketplace. And had I not moved, I probably would have been unemployed now because TV only is like, you know, it's not, it's not what's gonna be here in, in 10 or 15 years. So um, it was, some of it's luck, some of it's um, just seeing an advantage and taking advantage of, the, of, of that situation. Um, uh, but it wasn't, it's not necessarily something that you seek. And you're gonna all find that through your careers, which is the career you think you're gonna have, is gonna be way different. And, um, and how you get to where you end up is just a whole series of chance happenings and chance meetings and random conversations um, that you have. And it's just, it's just the way things go. Very rarely will it go the way you think it's gonna go because something's gonna come up, shit, shit happens as they say. And, um, and it's just that that's the way life is and that's the way your career is gonna be. So it's just, you know, it, it, and it, it goes into um, how you look for a job, how you find a job. It's again, it, 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 it's not necessarily seeing a job opening and applying. It just it generally doesn't work that way. You're gonna rely on people that you, that you know, people that you know, and people they know, and it's a whole networking thing. And, um, you know, that goes into job hunting, which is if you're gonna sit there and just apply to open jobs, you're very rarely gonna get a job that way. You're more likely gonna get a job through somebody who, uh, who is either a direct link to you or a second or third kind of person out of that link. Um, because a lot of times, um, you know, strangers don't hire strangers. It's just not that common. Um, so if you have no, um, you know, no link to something, it, it's way harder to make to make progress there than it is even if you have a small indirect link and you can say, well, my cousin's neighbor's friend, you know, recommended me. And it, it's a, it's just a, an easier entry into finding something. And a lot of times that's the way you find a job. Not all the time, but a lot of times. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I go off on a tangent. I don't want. It's to all right. Say. There's a good tangent to go off on, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm keeping an eye on the microphone. So if anybody wants to talk, if I see your microphone shut off, I, that's my cue that you have a question. And so don't be shy. I know sometimes it's difficult when you're afraid everybody's going to talk at once, right? If and if you've got the question, I'm sure. 14 other people in the, in the, in the room have, have the same question. If you're thinking, if you're asking, uh, you know, if, you, if you're questioning it, someone else, I guarantee is questioning. So there's no stupid questions. There's no, there's no, I'll answer anything. I have no agenda. Mike McAvoy has a question. Did you want to type it or go ahead and unmute yourself? There you go. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask if I teach the economics of sports and I see some of my, my students are here. Um, just want to give them a shout out. <laughs> And so, you know, so since I'm a teacher, I also have a really bad way of asking questions. <laughs> All right, so That's cool, you know, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's going to take me about a minute to get through this. No so um, you know, I, I recall uh, the most amazing team of all time, the 1985 Bears, uh, who was led by um, an OK quarterback named Jim McMahon, who used to wear the headband, and. Um, a little bit of frivolous, but you know he used to uh, have messages on the headband that uh, were important to him. Sometimes they were mocking and sometimes they were serious, but the NFL clearly did not want him to do that. Um, now, more recently, you know, like today, but not exactly today, uh, athletes are expressing themselves to um, what's important to them in regards to social justice. And the, the NFL, uh, again, more recently and today, appears to be a trying to accommodate uh, players' expressions in the workplace. Um, so, all right, having, you know, so that, that's, I'm trying to set up the question. Yep. <laughs> so 
as as this transition has occurred, how does how has this affected the value of the media rights, and how has this affected your ability to sell ads, um, not just in terms of the quantity, but also setting the rates? I'll turn off my mic. Um, for, let me just say I'm not speaking on behalf of the NFL, so I'm not I, I'm not representing the NFL. I'm representing me and Oneonta alumni, and so whatever I'm saying is not necessarily or is not the official NFL position. I'm just speaking as a, you know, as a private citizen. So I just want to say that for everybody in case this gets recorded and sent to CNN or something. Um, it, it does look like we're recording, but I, I appreciate an honest answer. <laughs> the, um, the, the short answer is um, that stuff generally isn't affecting the the rights or the media rights or or from a financial standpoint directly, um, I think that um, you know the the rights are done in a you know ten year kind of kind of uh, round. So uh, we have rights that are coming up in twenty twenty two or twenty twenty three, and those are ten year deals. So that'll go through ten twenty thirty three. Um, and whatever happens today or tomorrow doesn't impact that. What impacts that is consumption. So if ratings are up, if consumption of the media is up, you can get more money. If the consumption is down, maybe you get a little less money. And it's also relative to uh, how the NFL does versus the rest of the world. So if NFL ratings are down 10%, that's terrible. But if baseball ratings, which they are, are down 40%, well, the NFL is you know, still in pretty good shape, so we'll get the money. So the money part of it is not so much the, um, you know, the impact. You're dealing with 32 owners of the league, right? So they're, 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 the, the guys who own the teams are the league, the, the 32 people plus the commissioner. And the commissioner serves at their, you know, at their will. Um, and you've got some pretty big egos. You know, Jerry Jones has a big ego. And you know, all of these guys are, you know, they're all multi-billionaires, most of them, and they all, they're all used to calling their own shots. And, you know, their original, like if you go back two or three years ago when, when uh, with Kaepernick, um, you know, taking a knee, um, the original thought was, and I'm not sure you can really disagree with this, is, hey, when you're a player and you're in uniform and you're on the field and you're playing football, you're working. And, you, and keep, keep your thoughts to yourself. And the, the, the general argument at the time was, well, if I owned a restaurant and the waiter had a view on something controversial, and I pick abortion only because it's controversial, I'm not taking a side. But if, that, if the waiter was, in, was working at dinner in my uniform, in my restaurant, and started speaking to customers about his position on something controversial like abortion, if you were the owner of the restaurant and you saw that people were getting annoyed or people were not getting whatever it was, you'd say, hey, I don't really care what your views are. You can have whatever view you want, not while you're working. Take it outside, do it on the sidewalk, do it in your living room, do it in your backyard. I don't really care what you do, but not when you're serving dinner in my restaurant on my time. And that was the original view. Then, uh, and so that's why the NFL, that's why I, I believe the commissioner took the position, which is, you know, you can't do this. Then, you know, things evolved, things changed over the last two or three years, society changes. And this is just an interesting, as a side, the commissioner's father was a, was a senator in, from upstate New York, I think Buffalo area. And he was, um, he took a position at the time in the late 60s, early 70s, I think it was the late 60s, 69, 70, where he was um, against the Vietnam War. And he was a very, he was a Republican, but a very liberal Republican. And he got demolished by, uh, by President uh, Nixon and, and Vice President Spiro Agnew at the time. And he lost his Senate seat because of this position. And I think that that stuck with Commissioner Goodell as a child and now as a commissioner, which is, hey, just because someone takes an unpopular position at one point, you know, things change. So if you were anti-war in 1969, that was negative. If you were anti-war in 1972, 
in society, that probably changed a little bit. It wasn't seen as the same kind of, uh, as the same kind of upheaval, you know, the same kind of anti-establishment kind of position because it grew. So the same things as Black Lives Matter become more normalized in society and, and more, more accepted. Um, I think the commissioner saw that and backed off the original stance from the owners, which was, hey, you know, if you want to protest, you know, here are some outlets within the, within the game to protest. And you see, it, it, it's, not, you know, it's not that big a deal. When, the, when this first came up like three years ago, Trump was going after the NFL and tweets every day. And it was, it, was, it was very disheartening to see as an employee. And, you know, if you have the president of the United States, whether you like him or not, coming after you on Twitter every day, that's a very demoralizing thing. And you see that it, you didn't see the same thing this time because society changed. So when you see all of these things, it's not so much of a business impact as a reflection of what's going on in the greater society, which it's just, it's just an interesting aside. But from a business standpoint, not really. If people started turning off the game and said, I'm not watching NFL anymore because I don't like this messaging, which is possible, that's one thing. But short of that, no real financial impact. Long-winded answer, but I think I, think I, I, I answered it, right? I hope. So, but what about like the numbers of ads you're able to sell? Do you find some companies rethinking whether they want to sell, excuse me, purchase ads during the games or are you having, are you finding that you have to adjust your ad rates? No, no. The ad rate, the, number one, the ad rates are, the, the amount of time sold is fixed. So um, it's in the contract, it's in a 10 year contract and the networks just can't add or take away time. It's, it's a fixed element. Um, Secondly is, you know, nothing, you know, nothing, everybody wants to rub up against success. And in terms of national television, in terms of national exposure for a brand, in terms of the amount of reach you can get for your product in the NFL, it's unmatched. If you go to the top 50 shows in a given year, 48, 47 of them are NFL games. Um, you know, you had the, the uh, baseball, uh, you had the World Series, the MLB World Series going on now. Game one was down 40% from year prior, and it was the lowest rated World Series in history, in, in television history. You know, that's a problem for baseball, and that's where you could see drop off in terms of, um, you know, in terms of ad demand. But the NFL is not experiencing that. So really very little impact on the business standpoint in terms of uh, any kind of social, uh, you know, the, the social justice messaging or any of that doesn't change. What changes ads and, you know, the amount of money and, and, and the demand for ads is if consumption goes up or down, if television ratings go up or down, if, uh, if consumption on online streaming, you know, if you're streaming a game and the numbers go up, or down, you know, that's what's going to determine it. But you have to remember, you're dealing with 10 year blocks of deals. So it's, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't move that much. Um, it's macroeconomic stuff that changes it. This other stuff is, it's noise, but it doesn't really impact the business as, as greatly as, as you might think. Thank you. No problem. I wish uh, this was in person because normally we would take you around the, uh, the league office, which is kind of cool to see. They have the championship rings. You could see the uh, you could see some some trophies. It's just you know cool memorabilia in the office. So hopefully next year, uh, if this is uh, past us and we have a you know a COVID uh, vaccine, um, we could do this in person and I could actually take you around and show you something you know some some cool stuff rather than me sitting in my house. <laughs> Alexander, did you have a question you unmuted before? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Hey, Alexander. I have a passion for sports. I love the NFL, the MLB, the NBA, uh, and I'm in economics right now. So I was just wondering, how do you get a job in sports? That's not like as a player. You have to remember that I'm working at the league. I'm not playing at the league. So when I'm working every day and you know, whether it's, whether it's in my office or whether it's in my house, I'm sitting in front of a computer with spreadsheets, talking to people about media business, about this, about that. It's almost irrelevant because I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not playing football. I'm not, I'm not, I'm at, I work for the NFL, 
but I'm in the, the business end of the NFL. So you can, you know, there, there, there are spots to be within the, within the sports ecosystem, but just because you love something doesn't mean you have to do business with them so, or, or work for them. So you shouldn't just limit yourself to say, I love X and that's what I want to do. It's great if you can meld the two, but you shouldn't limit it to that because um, you, know, you can take an economics degree. I have a business economics degree. You can take the economics degree and do a million things. Yeah. Um, and if you limit yourself just to say, I want to work for these six entities because it's you know whatever entity it is or whatever team it is, um, you're blowing out you know 98 percent of the rest of the of the opportunities you might have. And again, I I started my career at a media agency, and then I went to Viacom. I was working at VH1, which is as far from the NFL as you can get, and and I ended up at the NFL. So when you're searching for a job. It's more important to find a job in something that you like doing um, rather than a place that you like. It's two different things. If, you're, if you like what you're doing and you can make a living at it, you're going to really excel um, as opposed to having a job at a company that you're like, I'm in love with the NFL, but I don't really like what I'm doing. You're going to be a miserable camper, I promise. So it, focus in on what, find, find something that you enjoy doing and if you could find, if you could find that, then it, 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 life will be a lot easier for you. You're not going to be miserable on Sunday night with that uh, shit. I got to go to work tomorrow. You don't want that. So it's great if you can meld the two and if you could, you could apply to all the sports entities, but you have to remember if you want to work, you know, for every, for every opening that we have at the NFL, there's a line of people out the door looking to get in because they love the NFL for whatever, whatever, whatever their motivation is. Um, and sometimes the road less traveled is easier to get to. So if you go to something that's not quite as in front and center and, and, and popular, you might have an easier go because, you know, the NFL, like, uh, like we hire interns every summer and, you know, for better or worse, the way the interns go, is um, you're going to take the top one or two or three people at the top three schools in the country, and they're all you know from Harvard and Yale and Princeton and you know you know you can name the schools, and um, and that's who we hire as interns, and so somebody coming from you know a SUNY, um, any SUNY, or somebody coming from something that's not Harvard and Yale, which is most of us, um, is going to have a very is going to have an impossible task ahead of them to get in. Um, where if you if you apply someplace that's a little more off the radar and a little more a little less front and center, you have a much better chance because the competition is less, and you don't have to fight something that you can't you can't you're not going to be able to beat the number two guy at Harvard. Most people can't, and it's not it's not a knock on any other. It's just a knock on on everybody except for the number two guy at, at Princeton. You know, it's it's hard it's hard to 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 compete with that. So while I say, yeah, try to find something at a place you love, it's more important to like what you're doing day in and day out. That, that, that's nine tenths of the battle. Because if, if you like what you do, you're gonna be really good at it, I promise. And if you're really good at something, you're gonna make a lot of, you know, you're gonna have a lot of opportunity to do that and make, you know, very, you know, a good living. You don't wanna be, you know, I don't think any of us wanna be poor either. So you have to do something that you can make a, you know, a decent, decent dollar at. Thank you. Okay. Guys, when you make, when you, when you, um, when you apply for jobs, um, whatever you send into these companies, whatever company it is, is your first, you know, it's your first impression. And you, you know, there's an old saying, you only make one first impression. Don't have any typos. Don't have any grammatical errors. You're not talking to your friends. Don't take shorthand. Don't put in, I, you know, don't put in uh, emojis. Don't put in anything. No, no cutesy stuff. No nothing. Um, make sure that it you are a hundred percent buttoned up. Not ninety nine point nine. Not ninety eight point eight. You need to be a hundred percent buttoned up. Have somebody go through. Make sure there's no typos. Make sure all the punctuation is right. I mean, this is all simple stuff. 
you'd be amazed at the, at the junk I see. And if someone's not taking the time and effort to spell something right or use the, use the correct grammar or punctuation, they're not getting hired. They won't even look at them. And equally important is follow up with a thank you. I let, two years ago, maybe three years ago, I interviewed somebody from Oneonta that caught my eye first when I got the resume and we had an opening and I brought her in and she interviewed great. She was really, really good. We were about to hire, we were about to extend an offer and we waited for a thank you. Never got a thank you for the, for the, for the interview, which is, that's poor follow-up. So, and, and we didn't offer the job, we offered it to someone else because she didn't send a thank you. So, you know, it, sometimes it's the small things, no mistakes, follow-up thank yous, when you shake somebody's hand, when you can finally meet somebody in person, give a firm handshake, look them straight in the eye, just do basic things, which most people don't do, and it sets you ahead of everybody else. It's incredibly low tech, and it's incredibly important, and a lot of people don't do it. So if you can, that's, and that's all easy stuff. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to have a 3.9 GPA to know how to do that. And it puts you above and beyond a lot of candidates. So give yourself every advantage by doing silly little things like, you know, what I just described. Um, is it all right if I ask a question? Ask as many questions as you want. Okay, so I'm from the Buffalo area and I will say that the the um, Bills fan base has a very large sphere of influence around the Pagulas. How would you say the NFL does in terms of depicting that fan base um, online and in their presence and acknowledging it? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what's the question about the, the, Bills, the Bills fan base being depicted by the NFL? Just in general, um, you know, we acknowledge that there is a very large fan base. And so I feel like the Pagoulas do a good job in our area. But the NFL as a whole, how well would you say they do in depicting individual fan bases and the support that they have for individual teams on their media platforms? I, I think the NFL does a pretty good job at promoting themselves. I mean, um, they're, you know, I, I think I think that um, where you get into trouble is non-NFL coverage. So if you get into Bleacher Report or you know any of those guys, um, sometimes they you know there's less than flattering coverage that goes on um, to some to some degree. Um, and um, but I think if you look at any NFL sanctioned media, it's all positive. Um, it's all, I, I think, I mean, I don't remember seeing negative stuff sanctioned by the NFL. So I think that, um, you know, the NFL coddles their, their coverage of their fans. Um, they want to make the fans feel good. They want to make the fans look good. Um, listen, they want those fans for, you know, once you have a fan, if you, if you grow up as a Bills fan, you're a Bills fan for life. Uh, even if you move to Miami, you're not going to be a, you know, a Dolphins fan. You're going to be a Bills fan. So I have plenty of friends who, who have moved down to Florida and, um, and they still follow the Jets and the Giants. So, um, you know, and, and, and from a business standpoint, that becomes an annuity. So if you're a Bills fan for life, you're gonna buy Bills shirts and Bills hats and Bills tickets and Bills this and Bills that and Bills cups. Um, and that's how the league makes their money. So the last thing they wanna do is show any, any fan or piss off any fan with, with, with negative coverage, even though, you know, we all know what goes on at certain games with certain fan bases. Um, you know, you can see that pretty much anywhere. And these idiots jumping off roofs and off the tables and all, all the stupid things that they do, um, you know, they're morons. But, and I'm not talking about the Bills, I'm just saying in general, fans, a lot of fans are just animals. But, um, and again, that's not an official NFL position. Um, but, uh, you know, but the official NFL is never going to highlight any of that stuff. And because there's, it doesn't make economic sense for them to do that. Um, they want to, they want to, uh, uh, they want to build up fan bases and, and, and have them for life because that, that's the business that we're in. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. What else you guys want to know about? It can't just be, I don't know. 
It can be anything. Interviews, business, NFL specific is fine. Anything you guys want to know about, I'm happy to answer. Um, I have a question. Um, what was your biggest learning experience at Oneonta and then also later on in your career? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, let me just think about that. Biggest, the biggest revelation for me coming, coming out of school was that where you went, the minute you get your first job, it doesn't matter where you went to school. So, you know, I talk about, uh, you know, I was talking about number two guy at Princeton. Once you have your first employment opportunity, no one really cares about whether you went to Oneonta, Binghamton, or Princeton. It, does, it, it becomes irrelevant. And what becomes relevant is how you conduct yourself in the workplace. Are you a valuable team member to the, to the, to the company? Um, and are you, you know, are you doing, uh, you know, an appropriate job for your position? Uh, are you appropriately aggressive and not inappropriately aggressive, you know, in terms of uh, how you handle your job? So that was the biggest revelation because I always thought, Jay, I'm coming from Oneonta. It's a great school, but it's not Princeton. Um, and am I going to be at a disadvantage? And the answer is no, you're not at a disadvantage because, again, once you get your first job, no one ever, generally not, not important where you went. No one's going to ask you what your GPA is after your second day of work. Nobody. People generally won't answer your, ask what your major was. It, it becomes important only for that first interview. Once you get past that, how you conduct yourself every day is, is infinitely more important, in my experience. Um, so that, that was a huge revelation for me. The other revelation for me was just because you think you don't know anybody who can help you, you know a ton of people. And it's especially true now. You can come back and say, you know, my parents uh, work in something that, that I've no, it's not, I have no interest in. My father, whatever, delivers milk and my mother is a school teacher and I wanna go into economics. And it's not, there's no connections. The shocking thing is, and especially now with social media connections, is that you know a ton of people. You just don't know you know them. So, you know, everyone's focused on who do they know that they can call and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. It's, you can go two or three rings out of, the, out of that connection with social media. So you can go, you know, you can just look through connections on Facebook or, or Twitter or, or where, whatever media you're using. And you can kind of look to see, hey, who is involved with economics or whatever your passion is, and who, who's involved in sports media, whatever. And it, it, it's not, you're able to connect with that person in an indirect way. And it's, you have to use all of those things to your advantage. So it's not just, oh, my parents don't know anybody. I, I have no connections. That's bull. You have lots of connections you just don't know about. So you really got to uh, mine that stuff for, for the appropriate information. And you've got to, you know, when you, when you graduate, I see there's a lot of people graduating at 21 on this list. Um, you need to go out and tell people that you're looking for a job and nothing is better than ever, nothing better to advertise that than social media. And you're not doing a broadcast out to everybody, but you could pinpoint certain people that you think are appropriate and say, hey, I see that you know my cousin Bill. And um, I see that you're interested that you that you work at whatever, and I'm interested in whatever, and um, and that's your connection. It's not stranger to stranger. All of a sudden, you're talking to someone who's friends with your cousin Bill, and it it's not it, it it's a very effective way to find uh, to find uh, a, a appropriate openings. So you know a lot more people than you think you know. And even if you think you know nobody, trust me, go through your social media posts and then start digging down. And once you start digging down and going two or three or four levels out, that's where you see the connections that you can make. And even though you can't make them directly to four people after your cousin Bill, but you can call your cousin Bill and dig down and get to that person in a pretty easy fashion. It's way easier than when I graduated, which was I had to go ask my cousin Bill, hey, who do you know? And then, you know, you make a phone call and, and go all the way down. So don't, you know, don't dismiss that because it's really, it's really powerful. Advertising works. People buy advertising because advertising works. If it didn't work, it, it wouldn't be sold. 
So you need to advertise the fact that you are looking for X and X position in whatever field that is. And you need to, you need to seek it out. It takes work. You're not going to, I, I promise you, don't go through the want ads or don't go to D.com or whatever the, the thing is now. Don't go to these, don't go to these websites and just look for open positions. That's not likely how you're going to find an open position. A bunch of strangers applying for a bunch of jobs to strangers doesn't garner employment. Most of the time you're going to find it through somebody that you know. And it could be the unlikeliest source. When I was when I was graduated from school, uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was going to go to law school. And I was waiting for a job that I applied to for the courts. My uncle was going to get me into the courts. I was going to become a court officer, go to law school at night. And there was a six month moratorium on hiring. So I said, for six months, I'll you know play around. And when this job opens, I'm going to go take the job and go to law school. In the meantime, I mentioned to my mother's friend in passing, hey, I, you know, I'm looking for a job temporarily. And she says, you know, my nephew works at an ad agency and they need an assistant, a starting level assistant. Go for the job. So I said, I hated advertising in school. Sorry to all the advertising majors. And, um, and I said, I'll take this job until this court thing opens up and then I'll go to law school. I started the job and I was like, wow, this is good. I kind of like this. And when the court, when the, when my uncle called and said, Hey, I have this, the job open for you. I said, you know, I kind of like what I'm doing. I think I can make a, a play with this. I'm going to not take that. Okay. And he was fine with it. And I had that, I was at that company for 20 years. Didn't, didn't even know this business existed when I came out of school. So it's these chance opportunities. And the more people who know that you need, that you're looking for something, the higher the likelihood is that you're going to make that connection. And all you need is that one random connection. And that's what it's going to be. It's going to be some, some random connect, connection that you don't even anticipate. That's how a lot of the people on this call are going to find their first job. And when you do, think back to this conversation. Thank you. No problem. Um, I have a question. Yeah. What would you say to someone that wants to go like right out of undergrad, right into their graduate degree? What advice would you give to someone like that? I can give you my thoughts. It doesn't mean it's right. So this is only my opinion. And my opinion is my opinion. It, 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 it doesn't mean it's correct for, for you. If you are a marketing major and then you want to get your, you know, advanced degree in marketing, that's great. But how do you know that you really like it? Like, what are you basing that on? So if you come out of school with a marketing with a marketing degree, you know, undergraduate degree, and then you go to work at a company for a year or two in that field and you say, gee, I really like this, then you're golden and you can continue. And by the way, a lot of companies that you're going to work for will help pay for your, um, for your, edu for your, you know, secondary, you know, for your, for your graduate degree. Um, the NFL does. When I was at Viacom, they did. When I was on the agency side, they did. So at the very least, you get a chunk of your, your, your bills paid by the company you're working for. It's definitely harder to get an advanced degree while you're working, but, you know, it, it's not impossible. Um, a lot of people who work for me do it. If you, I, I feel like a lot of times, and again, my opinion doesn't mean it's right. A lot of times people are coming out of undergraduate and for whatever reason, they're afraid to start working. They don't want to start working, whatever. And they say, I'm going to get, an, I'm, I'm going to get a graduate degree. I'm going to go straight in as kind of like a crutch. Um, and you know, what happens when you come out and you've spent another $60,000 $60, on an advanced degree in the field that you end up hating? Um, you know, that's a shame. That's a waste of time and a huge waste of money um, and, and, and time. The time is what kills you. The money you can always make back, the time is gone. Um, and then you got to start over after two years. And you have, you, so you've got your, you know, your, your advanced degree in marketing and you end up hating marketing. Then you go into something else. And then you know, the first question is, gee, you got your, you went to such and such a school and you got such and such a degree. And now you're interviewing for an entry level position as a steam fitter, whatever it is, doesn't make a difference. Um, that to me is, is, is problematic. 
So in my opinion, the advice I would give to the advice I give to my to my daughter, uh, he, both of them, is if you think you want an advanced degree, go to work for that in that field. Make sure you like it, and then do what you want. Make a decision from there. I think it's a smarter, more sane sense, a more sane um, kind of kind of path. Doesn't mean it's the right path for you. Doesn't mean it's the right answer for anybody. I gave you the answer I gave to my kids. So that's what I honestly believe. Doesn't mean it's correct for you. So that's my disclaimer for the day, among others. Thank you. No problem. Probably have time for maybe one more question. I know some students might have to go on to their next class, but um, before we wrap up, I just wanna see if there's anything, any more questions. Oh yeah, I have a question. That's great, go ahead. Um, what advice would you give someone who wants to build up their resume with experience and stuff, but they aren't sure where to start? I think, the, I think when I look at a resume, what I'm looking for is, um, you know, it's great if there's if there's um, uh, if there's uh, employment history or, or 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 some kind of history in the field, but I'm also looking for somebody who didn't just sit around doing nothing, and I'm not looking for a whole lot of fluff. You know, you build up a some. I, you should see some of the resumes I see. It, it, it's interesting. I think a resume that shows that uh, that you that you you took the time to uh, to to do things that were meaningful to you, you took the time um, to uh, you know to 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 outline and to and to to show that hey you took the initiative and you and you care and that you're a hard worker and that you're responsible. You showed up for three months at this job and didn't get fired. You know, whatever, whatever that is, because when you're coming out of school, it's a, you know, the, the employer is taking a flyer on you. They, they meet you for half an hour. They, they roll you around to a couple of different employees and everyone says, yeah, I think, they, I think they're nice. Um, but we don't really know who we're hiring. You know, you check, make sure your social media posts are clean. Don't have, don't have the, you know, don't have pictures of you in a bong or, or you know, the, a yard. Uh, you know, swiggling, whatever, make sure all that stuff's clean because we look. Um, that's the first thing I do is I check your social media posts. So either take it down or make it private or whatever. Um, but if the person was able to hold down a job, um, that's meaningful. If the person was able to hold down the same job over three or four summers and they kept going back to somewhere, that's meaningful. If the, if the person took the time to try to get an internship, even if it's not in the apply even if it's not the field that that they're that they're applying for that still shows initiative it still shows the ability to to take the initiative and do something rather than sit on your ass and you know i rode my bike all summer um that that's what that's what we're looking for i mean that's what i look for on 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 a resume and no mistakes no no typos but um but you know you, you have to just you know, whatever, whatever experience you have, and again, not everyone has the, has the luxury to take an unpaid uh, internship. Some people have to make money because they have to put money away for school and pay for tuition and books and food. I get that. So whether you're working at, you know, at a bank for, as an internship, or you're working at McDonald's flipping burgers, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not the important thing. The important thing is you were able to do either one of those things um, consistently, and we can call those people and they'll get a good reference and, um, and that you took the time to, you know, to, to, to make it through the whole summer or multiple summers and that you showed up on time and you were a reliable human being as opposed to some, just some fuck off who doesn't, excuse the language, but some, some person who doesn't give, you know, doesn't care and is going to show up 10 minutes late every day. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it's how you present what you do more so than what you actually did. Because if, we all know that not everyone has the same exact opportunities and all the same needs and all the same whatever. And you play up to what you got. Don't, don't be ashamed of what you did. Hi, you know, highlight it and put a good spin on it and move forward because that, that, I mean, that's what you did. Thank you. No problem.
Great, looks like some people are signing off. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, does anybody else have any last parting words? I didn't know if um, Dr. Splinter Foley Dental wanted to say anything. Um, just again, always thank you so much. We so appreciate your time. Um, I keep, we keep hearing a lot of the same kind of things and I hope that, that that's coming across the students that, you know, it's the, the things that you need to be successful are, they're a lot broader and a lot more like um, almost like common sense than, than you think. And I think that that's useful, but also encouraging. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. And, and all, all true, well, in my experience, all true. Thank you so much, Peter. We always enjoy talking with you and hope we can okay. actually see you in person next year. Hopefully we can have you up to the offices next year. I'd like nothing more than that. <laughs> so, all right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day. Thanks, you too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.